Now we would like to introduce Ron Grunstein is a professor of sleep medicine and NHMRC senior principal research fellow. He is a senior specialist physician in the University at, sorry of the University of Sydney and Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. He is also the medical advisor for Sleep Disorders Australia. Professor Ron Grunstein has been a consultant physician in sleep disorders for over 30 years and a pioneer in improving patient care in sleep medicine in Australia and internationally. He holds a Leadership Level 3 Investigator Award for the National Health and Medical Research Council to 2021 to 25 and has previously and was previously a Senior Principal Research NHMRC Fellow and Professor of Sleep Medicine at the University of Sydney. He heads the Sleep and Circadian Research Group at the Woolcock Institute of Medical Research and is the Chief Investigator of two NHMRC Centres of Excellence. Professor Grunstein has had a distinguished career in medicine domestically, being the first staff specialist appointed to a full-time position in sleep medicine in Australia in 1988. He was awarded the Australasian Sleep Association Distinguished Achievement Award in 2010 and the Royal Prince Alfred Founder Foundation Medal for Excellence in Medical Research in 2012. In 2014, he received the Distinguished Professor Award from the Sydney Medical School and in 2016 has been awarded the, the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand Research Medal. On Australia Day 2019, he was made a member of, Order, of the Order of Australia for significant service to medical e education and research in the field of sleep disorders. He is also recognised as a world leader in his field, having been the first person outside of North America to win the prestigious Nathaniel Kleitman Distinguishable Service Award from the Acad American Academy of Sleep Medicine in 2011. From 2007 to 2011, Professor Grunstein served as president of the World Sleep Federation, now known as World Sleep Society, the roof body of sleep researchers and clinicians internationally, organising successful world congresses in Cairns and Kyoto. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ron Grunstein. I think my 96-year-old mother wrote that. So. <laughs> it's, it's actually true. I once gave evidence in court and the, um, the barrister for my uh, one side, who was, and I was a witness, read out my um, CV but to, the, to the point where it was like taking nearly 10, 15 minutes and started listing all my publications. <laughs> and the judge told him to stop, and turns to me and says, Dr. Grunstein, your mother must be proud. <laughs> so I don't know whether they wrote it in the uh, report. A um, couple of apologies. Um, believe it or not, this is the first time I've given a public talk since, um, I don't know, 2019. Um, so I'm not used to it. Um, the second thing is... Uh, Thanks to uh, Alan Joyce, uh, I have to get up at like half past four this morning to get here. So if I'm a bit slow, I apologise. Um, I wanted to thank the organisers, uh, particularly Michelle, for asking me, and more importantly, to, to have this, this uh, event and yesterday's event. Um, okay. So I've been asked to talk about why is there a problem with IH and, and narcolepsy in Australia um, and why are we so far behind. And I, I need to put a disclaimer sort of straight away that we may be a bit behind the University of Montpellier, but we're probably ahead of a lot of other <laughs> places in, in, in terms of uh, training and availability of medical service. I'm not saying we're doing a great job, but we need to put it in, in a little bit of perspective. W why do we have a, a problem? Well, I'm going to talk about these different components and 
Again, this is a personal point of view. I'm sure many of you in the audience and, and people listening have their own thoughts about this. Um, so, I mean, you've got to look at history and the reality is that CPAP was developed um, in Australia. I mean, I started with CPAP patient number eight, and that was in end of 1983, uh, when Colin Sullivan had already been, you know, working on it for two years. And this has sort of dominated the space of sleep in Australia uh, subsequently. Um, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, we have some of the leading companies in the world in that area. We have, um, you know, we're known research-wise for our wide experience in, in sleep apnea, and Australia punches well above its weight in sleep apnea. Many groups, um, not just ours, but many groups are involved in that effort. Um, but there's a downside to that, and that is that the field of sleep has been very much controlled by thoracic or respiratory medicine, and, and as such, <coughs> disorders that have a non-respiratory colour to it, including narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnolence and insomnia and many other disorders have not had champions um, in the, in, around. Um, there have been a lot of battles um, that I've been involved in over the years to try and re sort of return the equilibrium to a little bit of a fairer situation and that one of those led to the formation of the Australasian Sleep Association in 1988 but it's been a long battle and even now, um, there's still sort of a problem which I'll, I'll go, go into. Um, it's actually quite funny to tell you that <laughs> the Medical Research Future Fund just released a, a grant for targeted therapies in respiratory, chronic respiratory conditions. And when we rang the MRFF and said, well, hang on a sec, you don't have sleep apnea on your list of chronic respiratory conditions, we're told, well, actually, it's not a respiratory condition. Um, so it seems like people have bets each, each way. Um, I think the other thing, too, has been the attitude of neurologists. I mean, I, I had a fortune of being a medical student at Stanford University in 1979 with Christian Gilman and Bill DeMent. Um, and Christian, was, who's part, just passed away, was a mentor for me then because I got fascinated by the area of sleep. My very first patient was a young anaesthetist who developed narcolepsy and got cataplexy when he was intubating people. So I thought this is just a fascinating sort of area of medicine. And if you look around there, the you know neurologists are very active in sleep, certainly very active in Europe. Eve is a neurologist. But it's never really happened much in Australia. Um, and the barriers put up for neurologists to become sleep physicians. We're training someone now who has got a PhD in sleep. He's worked in our clinics, but they want him to do two years of training, whereas a respiratory trainee only has to do one year. So there's sort of sort of problems. But the neurologists themselves, as, a, as an organisation, have not been particularly interested in sleep disorders. There's been a few, but as such, there hasn't been that level of, um, of, a, of action. The other thing is the attitude of the um, health regulators and the College of Physicians who are against the idea of new specialties. The re more paperwork for them, more, more you know, rules and things like that. And you know, I've, I've come up, I and many others have come up against a brick wall in trying to get the concept of sleep medicine as a specialty. Um, I guess one area that's interesting is they really want our opinion when it comes to deciding who should drive a car, but they, they don't, don't really want, want our thoughts in other areas. So it's been a very CPAP sort of centric area. I think the other problem is the view, um, certainly, of, of sleepiness, but narcolepsy, IH, and, and the spectrum uh, in the community and that is that it's a bit of a joke. Well, that's the reality. Um, you've got all these uh, movies there, Juice Bigelow, Rat Race, 
um, even Moulin Rouge, um, River Phoenix in his last uh, movie. And, you know, most of them are poking fun uh, at the sleepiness and there hasn't been really much of a, of a sort of look at the, the human side of the problem. And, you know, there are all these... You know, I found this slide, all these movies and TV shows where some of them are bit, bit better than others, but essentially there hasn't been a real concept of these central disorders of hypersomnolence as a chronic disorder that affects people and affects their lives. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will change. I think the other problem that we need to overcome is the problem with our training um, in, in sort of medical, in fact, all clinical sort of psychology is no, no, no different. Um, and there's in clear inadequacy. Um, GP education is very much, you know, f after they've gone through medical school and GP training, they're very focused on, on drugs. And, um, you know, uh, there's not a lot, what education there has been in hypersomnolence has been really aimed at specialists. Um, specialist training, um, it's really lacking. I mean, there's a few points that I, I'd make. One is there really is any informal training about sleep in psychiatry, which is a bit crazy, since most psychiatrists uh, deal with a lot of sleep problems. Um, and, you know, not a lot of interaction between psychiatrists. A few of us who have clinics where we have psychiatrists actually wedded in, and I've had a PhD student who's been a, who's a psychiatrist, and we're slowly getting sort of traction, but it's really slow. Um, the, you know, neurology training, there really isn't much formal uh, training in sleep. Um, and this is, as I said, disappointing because there's so much um, that a neurologist could offer uh, in, this, in this space. The other, um, you know, I've talked about respiratory sleep medicine as a specialty. It's not, you know, and I, I really defy my colleagues to say that you can be a fully competent respiratory physician and a fully competent sleep medicine specialist. It's just not on anymore, you know. I mean, I know my, my own training, I, I did in the days when training was a lot more flexible. I've never done a bronchoscopy. I've never looked after lung cancer. I was very fortunate because there wasn't any training guidelines. Now there are training guidelines, but the joke is that you only have to see 30 patients with non-respiratory sleep disorders to get your ticket. So I can tell you that having trained a lot of people, that I get people who decide their training is inadequate, who've never prescribed a, a stimulant before for any patient with hypersleep. Doesn't have a, they don't have a clue about how to deal with um, non-respiratory sleep disorders, and yet they have a ticket. And, uh, you know, I've complained about it. Uh, many others have as well. And we just need to change that. That's just a, a whole weakness of the system. Um, the, other, the other point is that, you know, in medicine, things take a long time to, to change, right? I mean, you know, narcolepsy was first described in the 1880s. Um, amphetamines have been around a, a long time. It really wasn't, I think, till the 50s that people started realising that it could be used for more than just uh, cheering people up. Um, the, uh, the concept of, of REM onsets, relatively recent. I know Michelle wrote an excellent article uh, with Roger Broughton on Biedrich Roth, who well described idiopathic hypersomnolence, um, you know, 1980s, probably thought about it well before then. But, you know, it's just a slow sort of process. And these are the, the changes. The big change, I think, came with Erexin. I don't want to date myself, but I was actually at the first conference where they presented the sort of stuff about Erexin. And we began to understand there's a biological basis that can be for... for certainly for narcolepsy and possibly for, for other uh, central disorders of hypersomnolence. But it's still a relatively recent sort of finding. And I think the availability of Erexin antagonists for insomnia 
and now, as Eve pointed out, are ex and agonists uh, for sleepiness. Um, I know it may seem like a long time ago, Sydney Olympics sort of time, but uh, that's pretty quick when it comes to farmer development. And there's also been a huge increase in understanding about the um, neurobiology of, of, of sleep, full stop, you know, what, what makes people sleepy, what keeps people a, a, awake and so forth. And I think these advances are one of the ways in which we are slowly sort of catching up and what will be a benefit of patients. We don't have the, what do you call it, operation warp speed for, for sleepiness like they had for, for um, COVID, but, you know, it, it's, it's sort of happening. You can see that by this slide, this is PubMed, so this is where you have all publications listed by the um, um, National Library of Medicine. And you can see here the growth in the number of papers each year um, related to, this, to the condition. So this is for narcolepsy, or at least where the word narcolepsy is used. And you can see a dramatic increase over the last few years. This is idiopathic hypersomnolence, and uh, again, there is an increase, but clearly much less uh, than there, much less overall than um, there is for narcolepsy. But it's it's slowly sort of happening. The other problem, I think, to some extent, is the attitude towards the medications, um, and that's not an Australian phenomenon. That's a phenomenon around the world. Um, you know, as I said, um, amphetamines used to be sort of happy pills. Um, I guess some people still use them in that form, but probably against the law. Um, it was a big thing for weight loss in the 50s and 60s. Um, I think Elvis and people like Hitler could get theirs from their doctors and things like that. But there's still there's a sort of, um, uh, you know, negativity about about uh, medications. I recently read an, an article by an advocate for narcolepsy in the United States who wrote in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine that orexin um, antagonists are used for alcohol use disorder. So they're used to prevent addictions. And there's a lot of research now happening in Australia and overseas in that space. So his contention was, well, people with narcolepsy don't have any orexin, so they're not going to run into problems with addiction. Um, it's a difficult one. There's no data on that. There's some anecdotes and so forth. But the other point, as Eve made, is you can't just keep upping, upping amphetamines because of the cardiovascular side effects, um, which can be quite, quite scary. So, you know, sometimes you've got to balance advocacy with reality. Um, the other thing that we, we've encountered, I've, I've certainly encountered, and some of my colleagues have, has been this response by the health authorities to central disorders of hypersomnolence, particularly, you know, drugs used or initially, initially used for narcolepsy. Um, and when we went as a group to push for modafinil to the PBS and say you need to give this to people who meet the criteria for, for narcolepsy, and we managed fairly cleverly to extend it to idiopathic hypersomnolence, I think. But the, the point was, they don't, so he said, guys, you know, if you start giving this to every truck driver in Australia, we're going to get rid of it, you know? That was a sort of like a threat. I mean, the head of the PBS at that time was a pretty rough sort of character, no longer there, but that was this sort of, sort of attitude. Um, so, you know... The interesting point is that you see Eve talking about, you know, amphetamines are fairly like sort of almost last resort sort of thing. Well, with us, we've tried to point out that for almost every modern drug, you have to have a randomised controlled trial to show evidence of its efficacy and, and so forth. Well, there's nothing for dexamphetamine. It came out in the 1930s, started using in narcolepsy in the 1950s. Um, and suddenly the whole attitude shifted. Ah, oh, you know, you know dexamphetamine is the first choice. So technically you still have to say that the person has side effects to dexamphetamine to get modafinil. Um, 
I say some of us are a bit ec economical with the truth, um, but the, the reality is it's a stupid sort of si situation. And we need to push more for comparative, what they call comparative effectiveness studies, to show that you know, dexamphetamine comes at a cost and that some of the newer drugs are, are safer. Certainly dexamphetamine you know, may have a role, but we have a problem in Australia in that that's seen as the first line of treatment by the PBS. Um, the other point was when Oxabate came in, you had to get every chief medical officer of every state to agree um, to that situation. So, you know, I said, we, you know, guys, you're legalising a date rape drug here, you know, you've got to be careful. And they were warning that we shouldn't stop, you know, they've got to approve it. We, if we import it, we're going to go to jail and all that sort of stuff. So there was that sort of attitude. And I think to some extent, there still is a lot of problems. A lot of problems with understanding the prevalence of, of things, you know, disorders. You can't get it, what they call orphan drug status, unless your prevalence is low. Um, the concept of paying ten, twelve thousand dollars a year for Oxabate doesn't pay attention to its its life-changing effects on a lot of people, um, and yet we fork out over a hundred grand for a hepatitis C, B, whatever drug. I'm not not saying that's not justified, but there isn't that relativity, and part of that is caused by the fact that there's a lot lack of knowledge, scepticism. And, and, and so forth. Um, the other thing is also local pharma. You know, you might think they want to they wide, widen their use of medications, but there's a great fear there about not getting any regulatory approval. So they're always going for narcolepsy, for N1 narcolepsy, which is, as you may well know, a fairly rare disorder. Um, but they don't want to talk about idiopathic hypersomnolence. And when we bring it up as advisors to the companies, they say, oh, yeah, we understand, but, you know. Um, so that's another problem. So the reality is, for patients, you've got a severe um, disease with an unmet medical need, and this is a survey, um, you know, from patients uh, in the United States. This is for narcolepsy, but I think it's, it's clearly relevant for the whole spectrum of, of disorders. Frustration, um, unhappiness about lack of treatment and a need for new treatment options. Obviously, this is put out by and funded by a drug company, but I think the, the findings are still uh, you know, pretty relevant. Um, what about research funding? It's basically zilch for narcolepsy and zilch for idiopathic hypersomnolence. That one funded uh, study, um, I don't actually believe it ever took place because it was for colleagues in Adelaide who thought they had a magic blood test for narcolepsy and they published it in The Lancet and they never uh, were able to replicate their results. So I think they gave the money back, but somehow it's ended up in the thing. So really, I don't think there's been any, any real funding um, we're trying to push now with the MRFF um, to at least look at comparative effectiveness studies, possibility of patient registries and so forth, but it's a, it is an uphill battle. Um, I think the, the message came out pretty loud and clear at the parliamentary inquiry that, that patients were sort of frustrated. Um, and they made the point, and I think that was quite telling, um, that respiratory specialists, you know, this is really a, a Cinderella sort of disorder for them, um, you know, and the, the concern about lack of expertise. Unfortunately, I think the parliamentary inquiry um, got a bit hijacked by the health department, who, you know, don't like being told what to do, um, but also COVID. I think the reality is that a lot of things have just been put on the back burner because of COVID, and I don't know what our opportunity is. Um, I'm not sure whether Trent Zimmerman is actually going to win his seat. <laughs> so it's a tricky one. Um, again, even some of my colleagues have gone public and said, you know, this is, uh, we need to have sleep specialists. 
and then I think that's one of the main points that I'd, I'd make is that we need to get our own uh, medical house in order. Um, the ASA has asked, um, you know, clinicians their different thoughts about um, how many patients they would manage. And again, this is for narcolepsy, but I can tell you that I'm sure a lot of people included in that were you know, had an IH sort of diagnosis. Um, and I've got to say, there is dissatisfaction amongst the medical profession in terms of what's available, the, the bureaucracy related to the you know, prescription of drugs, and that cost much less than drugs where there's much less bureaucracy. So it's a sort of sort of a problem. So what can we do? Um, and I've alluded to a few things about, um, and I think one of the strongest things that I advocate for is pushing hard for sleep medicine as a specialty of its own. Um, and there's obviously barriers, but I don't think you're going to get proper management of non-respiratory sleep disorders until that's the case. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a standalone specialty, but it also needs to involve people with backgrounds in psychiatry, um, neurology, and any, any really any specialist who's sort of interested in, in the field. And there are, there are many. I mean, for example, you, you're going to see in the next few years a big issue with obesity management with some of the new drugs which are essentially safe waste, weight lo loss drugs and the involvement of endocrinologists in looking at sleep apnea as an outcome. So it's going to be an interesting uh, time over the next few years. But, you know, there's always been a lot of self-interest. I mean, sleep studies were a fairly lucrative sort of business opportunity and that led to people, um, I think, you know, going into labs and things like that essentially is sort of CPAP factories and ignoring the, the need to do measurements of, of hypersomnolence and assess patients. Um, in general, we need to obviously improve the curriculum, but also not just in medicine, but in dentistry. Um, things like ENT, that's medicine, I guess, um, uh, nursing, um, and... Uh, you know, one of the most interesting ways that I've, I've, I've personally managed to get more interest in this area is actually setting exam questions. Because once you put in them in exam questions, you know, everyone suddenly, you know, and I think that's been a big uh, ability, say, in gener general physician training for people to recognise sleep as a, as a problem when suddenly they're confronted by a question that they don't have an answer with. Four. One of the other things that I, I think is a problem, and that's a problem that I... I personally also found myself, is, you know, when you sort of grow up in sleep medicine, you kind of view, say, cataplexy as something where people sort of just collapse to the ground and, and that sort of thing. And when we actually started doing this Avidel study that, that um, Eve spoke about, you realise how subtle cataplexy uh, can be. Um, so, you know, again, part of the education at all different levels is to really learn from the, the experts like Eve um, and, and, and understand the sort of problems with, with sort of diagnosis and understand, you know, the issues now about classification and, and, and so forth. I mean, I've got to be honest, you know, if you wanted to get more traction, you'd probably call um, idiopathic hypersomnia. I'm not suggesting to do this, but you'd call it narcolepsy spectrum disorder or something like that because people understand... In, in, in health, what, you know, what narcolepsy is, and you can differentiate that sort of thing. I'm not suggesting it, but this is the issue of communicating to the people who, who, who don't know. And that's what I mean by sort of improving government health lit literacy, getting them to sort of understand. Um, I think we can only grow local research when we develop researchers, and that means getting people interested in the, in the field and breaking this sort of nexus between the only sleep research that's done in Australia is related to sleep apnea and maybe occasionally insomnia and shift work. Um, one problem, we don't know how common these disorders are, and there really isn't great epidemiology. So I think if there was, we'd, we'd do better. I mentioned registry studies. I know there's been attempts by patient groups 
but all of this costs money and all of this should be done in, in a collaborative effort um, between uh, the medical profession and, 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 and patients. And again, we're trying to work on in that space. Um, Eve mentioned uh, my f rather poor attempts at getting an erection assay in Australia. It's not, you've got to understand I'm not a chemist, um, but getting people interested in this area, we're slowly starting to get a bit of, bit of traction. Problem really is that erection assays aren't that needed urgently, like relative to other things clinically. So there's been a maybe a lesser drive in this. And of course, engaging industry to, to uh, broaden their horizons a little bit. Look, uh, you know, Eve's gone through all this. Uh, there's lots of different sort of medications which are available. The Erexin Agonist, the Takeda drug, and there's another one by an American company. Um, they're coming and their trials will be in Australia even as early as, as later this year. Um, and we've been involved in some of the assessment of potentially looking at, at these things. But it's early days. So you're talking about phase two and then the American drug phase, what they call phase one studies. So it's still a while away, but it's slowly getting traction. Um, the ASA has sort of tried to get active here in the area of a drug approvals and trying to smooth the process. Um, and, you know, I talked about often and the challenge of getting first, you know, sort of changing the first line sort of approach. And we're pushing, maybe, you know, not hard enough, but we are pushing. Even writing in the sort of Medical Journal of Australia, where people actually, um, you know, at least the medical politicians read that. I'm not sure many other people do, but um, they... Um, you know, just getting narcolepsy and, and by inference IH on the agenda uh, is important. Um, I think the parliamentary inquiry, although, you know, it hasn't really had much traction, allowed people to get some things into, into official sort of documents. And it's been very useful for us when writing grants to say that there's been a parliamentary inquiry that says various things, um, you know, that we need to improve knowledge, that um, we need to improve at all different levels. Um, we need to, an independent specialty of sleep medicine. Um, and there needs to be work in narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnolence. And I know that the ASA recognised the lack of uh, knowledge amongst, as I said, sleep, even sleep medicine specialists. So, Organising webinars, getting experts from overseas to speak, again, is a part of this effort that's slowly, slowly, slowly changing. And so I, I have, you know, some degree of optimism for the future. I don't think it's all bad news. I think we are doing something to get things back on track, but it is, unfortunately, a slow process. Yeah, I'm happy. I know there's a question and answer session later, so I'm happy to answer questions. I'll be around. Thank you.